Welcome to Chapter 3, Economic Growth and Development on NyQuil. In the previous lecture, we did math for the sake of math, learning about dynamical systems and fixed points. This case, this chapter, we're going to be doing math for the sake of economics. So let's go ahead and get started. What are the difference between developed and developing countries? Well, health outcomes could be a big one, right? In the U.S., you know, diarrhea gets you a couple of bad jokes thrown your way. Maybe people complain about, you know, the way that you smell. You take some Imodium, you clear that shit right up, pun intended. But in poor countries, that, that shit will kill you, pun intended. Now, I took that from the Tyler Cowan and Tabarrok, uh, Alex Tabarrok, I think, uh, textbook um, when they're talking about growth. I liked it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was kind of funny because, you know, poop jokes. Everyone loves a good poop joke every now and then. And uh, so I took it and ran with it. So don't think that this is original to me. Uh, no, I took it from the Cowan and Tabarrok book. Uh, because, you know, we all know that people in higher education are getting uh, shit-canned, <laughs> pun intended there, uh, for things like plagiarism. So I need to make sure that I am covering my ass, pun intended. Okay, enough with the poop jokes for right now. Doubtful, though. Probably lying here. So why are some countries richer than others? Um, well, when we analyze, when we look at things through the lens of growth and development, we're asking ourselves questions like, why are these countries richer? Why is the United States richer than Mexico, for example? Why is it richer than even, you know, other fairly developed countries? Look at Italy, right? These things, um, you know, there, there are vast differences across countries. We get to learn about all of that and more in this lecture. So stay tuned and don't turn that dial. Because back in the day, TVs actually had dials on them. They used to change channels. Back when TVs were just TVs and not little mini computers. I've actually seen TVs with dials on them. I've used TVs with dials on them. I am, in fact, that old. Uh, but cable is older than I am, so there's at least that. There's something that's older than me these days. So what are we going to be learning about? Well, we're going to learn about growth and development, which is kind of like, you know, a big duh, because, well, the title of the chapter is Economic Growth and Development. Uh, it'd be kind of weird, kind of shitty, if you didn't learn about economic growth and development. Pun intended there, trust me. So we're going to be learning about things like the growth in real per capita GDP over time and like what drives it, how we can measure it, how we can model these things, and then how we can use the results of those models for policy implications. Like how can we spur innovation and growth, not just in the United States, but in other countries as well? How can we make poorer countries as rich as the United States? Because, well, some countries are richer than others. It's just a fact of life. It sucks. But it is what it is. Some countries are more developed. Some countries have that infrastructure where they can be on the cutting edge of research and development when it comes to the growth. Some countries aren't quite there yet. Now, in America, per capita GDP is really high and infant mortality is really low. And, you know, we really only tend to worry about whether or not we're going to get the new Android, shade thrown at iPhones, um, or, you know, what new thing... Our current president's going to post to Twitter or, you know, some gaffe that he's going to make, uh, what grade we're going to get in this class, things like that. In other parts of the world, though, one family shares one phone. Kids don't have access to quality education, and they can't make fun of their government the way that we do here. A lot of other countries are really poor. But even the currently rich countries weren't always that way. The U.S. wasn't always rich. In fact, we started out poor. Everybody starts out poor. Here's the interesting thing. We are 25 times richer now than we were in 1820 in the United States. And that's in real terms controlling for inflation. If it was nominal, it would be totally bonkers, insane, high number. But that's nominal. We need to think about controlling for inflation, thus maintaining the purchasing power. So for every dollar you had in income in 1820, you would have $25 now. So like your what, like great, 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 great grandparents... Actually, that's probably too many, like great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. They made $4,000 in annual income in 1820. You would be making $100,000 now. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about it because if we're going to study growth and development for these policy implications, we need to know what worked and what didn't. Where did things go right? Where did things go wrong in the U.S.? Because if we know that then we can apply that to developing nations, countries that aren't quite where the U.S. is, but maybe we can help them get there. Now, regardless of what policies make us rich 
and which policies don't. How does all this shit work? Well, think about it like in the Stone Age, right? You get some caveman named Claude. He invents the wheel. Well, we can use the wheel to move all sorts of heavy stuff around. Even after Claude's dead, the wheel's still around. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Let's move forward a little bit, right? Past just when the wheel was invented. Well, people have civilizations, we have carriages to move people around, and cars come around, right? Everything builds off of the existence of the wheel. So growth is really compounding upon itself because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's already been invented. That idea already exists. It's been taken from the ether and brought into the real world via the creation of the wheel. So we don't need to recreate that wheel. We don't need to reinvent it at all. We can just take the wheel and then put cool things on it. Like, you know, put four of them together with a little board in between, and boom, we have a little, you know, little carriage thing. And then somebody says, hey, let's have a horse draw that. Cool. And then someone goes, I'm going to put an internal combustion engine on it. Even better. Because cars are freaking awesome now. It's so badass. But the point is that growth is compounding on itself, which means every period that we have output, let's call it YT, the next period's output, YT plus one, will be this period's output plus however much the economy grew by. We'll call that growth rate gamma. In this case, we would have YT plus one equals YT plus gamma times YT. So we're adding gamma YT to YT because if gamma is the growth rate of output, then the growth rate of output times output this period tells us what it will be next period. In other words, YT is what we already had from this period. That's like the wheel. Or say the horse and buggy, right? That's YT. Now, we've already got the horse and buggy, so we're going to add gamma YT, which is the internal combustion engine, onto the buggy, thus removing the need for the horse. So... To get the next period, we just add gamma yt to what we already had to give us what we are going to have next period. So if output this period was 100 and the growth rate is 0 0.03, meaning output grew by 3%, then, well, 0 0.03 times 100 is 3, and we add that to 100. So I get 100 plus 100 times 0 0.03, which is 3, 100 plus 3, I get 103. So by equation one, which is right here, I can see that yt shows up twice on the right-hand side of the equation, which means I can just factor it out, right? So I get yt plus one equals one plus gamma times yt. Now, does that look a little familiar to lecture one where we went over the dynamical systems and fixed point stuff? It should because it does. This is one of the dynamical systems that we were looking at. Now, I didn't show you guys how to get like the fixed point for this, but I still just wanted you to see it so that, you know, by the time you see it now, you're like, oh, I've actually seen that before, and you feel a little bit more comfortable with it. This is a model for what's known as exponential growth. Why is it exponential? Well, it's exponential because it's compounding on itself, and it can carry forward to more than one period, right? We can push it forward to two periods. Now, remember, yt plus 1 equals yt plus gamma times yt. So yt plus 2 is equal to yt plus 1 times gamma yt plus 1. Now, because I've got that yt plus 1 equals yt plus gamma times yt, what I can do is I can substitute that into yt plus 1 in equation 3, and that gives me yt plus 2 equals yt plus gamma yt plus gamma times yt plus gamma times yt. So I can rearrange some stuff. And yt plus 2 is now in terms of yt rather than yt plus 1. And I got yt plus gamma yt plus gamma yt plus gamma squared yt. And I can group it like you see in equation 7. yt plus 2 equals yt plus 2 gamma yt plus gamma squared yt. And then that gives me yt plus 2 equals 1 plus gamma squared times yt. So a neat little trick here, if you look at equation 7, that's actually Pascal's triangle. So look at Pascal's triangle. It's a great way to do the, the foil, uh, what first outer, inner, last thing that you learned with, you know, the x plus something times x plus something else, whatever it was, right? It's just Pascal's triangle. A really neat little trick. But anyways, so yt plus 2 is 1 plus gamma squared times yt. 
And I could iterate it to yt plus 3 and yt plus 4 and all that, or I can just tell you it holds for all time periods moving up to n time periods. So could be two time periods, could be three, four, five, six, whatever. So if you want three periods ahead, what you would have is yt plus 3 equals 1 plus gamma cubed times yt. And if you want to move it all the way up to n periods, yt plus n equals 1 plus gamma to the power of n times yt. If I wanted five periods ahead, well, yt plus 5 equals 1 plus gamma to the power of 5. Plotting out real GDP in the U.S. over time in billions of dollars between 1945 and 2023 shows me this. All right now, if you look, it's got like a little bit of a curve to it. It's not a straight line. Why is that? Well, it's because real U.S. GDP actually grows exponentially. It doesn't grow linearly. Now, if you were to average it across you know, multiple time periods, you would get like a nice constant growth rate. As you zoom in the time periods, well, you know, we have weird little dips. We have business cycles. We have recessions. Uh, we have COVID. We have the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. We have the dot-com bomb. We have all these business cycles. But if you kind of ignore the business cycle and you just look at, say, where it was here and where it was here, you get a nice constant growth rate between these two periods. And that's kind of what that gamma is telling us. It's like a constant growth rate. So let's say just that gamma is 2%, right? Gamma, the economy grows at 2% a year, and our starting years per capita GDP is $10,000. What's per capita GDP in a year? Well, the answer to that's nice and simple because of that cool exponential growth function that we saw. Just take the equation, plug in 10,000 for yt, now, it's listed as y0 in the book, or why not, as t equals 0 in the initial period. But just screw it, plug in yt. 1 for n, 0 0.02 for gamma. And that gives us yt plus 1 equals 1 plus 0 0.02 to the power of 1 times 10,000, which gives me $10,200. Two periods ahead, well, it's 1 plus 0 0.02 squared, so... 1.02 squared times 10,000 is going to give me $10,612.08. So the economy still grows by 2%, whether it's the first year or the second year, but the amount that's growing grew by 2%. So that's not linear growth. It's log linear growth. So cutting back, this is like a log linear growth. Well, this is exponential growth, but if you want to see log linear growth, that would be this right here, the log of real U.S. GDP over time. What I did is I took the natural logarithm of real U.S. GDP. And if you look, it's a little bit more of a straight line than what we had here with this like exponential growth. Natural logarithms are awesome. You're going to be seeing a lot of them, by the way. So why is it log linear, right? What makes it that? Well, let's take the natural logarithm and see what it's going to give us. I'll get yt plus n equals 1 plus gamma to the power of n times yt. Now, if I take the natural log, right, it's going to undo the multiplication and turn it into addition. So the natural log of yt plus n equals n. I take that exponent, this exponent here, and I bring it down in front of the natural log of 1 plus gamma plus the natural log of yt. So... If you treat yt as like that constant or the, the starting point when t equals zero on that line, you have something in slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b, where b would be yt, x is equal to n, or the number of periods, and m is the natural log of 1 plus gamma. So this is now log linear, which means since gamma doesn't change at all. Growth is considered to be constant over time. Again, that doesn't mean linear. It means constant growth rate. So if the U.S. grows at an average rate of 3% per year, gamma is 0.03. And this is log linear growth, which means that growth is occurring at a constant rate. So here's a question for you. How long will it take for an economy's GDP to double? How long to double growth? Well, Let's start with yt plus n, let it be equal to 2yt, and we need to solve for n, or the number of periods for the economy to double in size. So here's another hint for you to work on. You're going to get 2 times the natural log of y equals n times the natural log of 1 plus gamma 
plus the natural log of y. And see if you can work on that before the next lecture. I actually believe there's something in the book. So if you get stumped, you can look at the book. And if nothing else, you can always just Google how long is it going to take for something for growth to double. So that's actually enough math for now. Let's talk about some facts about economic growth. Richer countries have been growing for longer than developing nations are. So really, what you can the way you can think of this for developing nations is that some were late to the party, but they still showed up, and some haven't showed up to the party yet. Now, the countries that were late to the party tend to grow at a much faster rate than developed nations. Now, why would that be? Does that strike you as odd? Maybe you're like, okay, well, they, they just started out, but why are they growing so damn fast? Well, they're growing fast because they're using the technology that exists that's already been made, and they implement it into their society, and as a result, they're going to experience a boom in economic growth for a bit. This is what's known as catching up growth. Now, eventually, once they use all that technology and they you know, update their infrastructure and all that, they get more and more developed, that growth is going to slow down to what's known as cutting edge growth. Now, developed countries don't grow as fast. They don't grow as fast because they're developing new technologies, which takes time. So as developing countries get more developed, they slow from catching up growth down to what I had said, cutting edge growth, which is the type of growth that developed countries experience. Countries that grow very fast and catch up to developed nations are what's known as growth miracles. Right? The Asian tigers are an example of growth miracles. In only a few decades, they went from being extremely poor to almost as rich as the United States, with some of them actually as rich as us. So what about the countries that haven't yet? Well, there's countries that haven't started growing or sadly grow backwards, and they're a different type of situation. So the countries that grew really, really fast and got caught up to the developed nations, those are growth miracles. The countries that don't grow or grow backwards are known as growth disasters. Now, this isn't like a recession where like the economy contracts for a while and then recovers and starts to grow again. You know, yeah, recessions occasionally happen, but they're not really considered in growth. Instead, these growth disasters are like they just they're not growing at all or they're consistently growing backwards, right? They're they're losing um, value in their economy. Um, you know, yeah, the U.S. has had some pretty bad recessions, but the U.S. still grows at a positive rate after the recession. Other countries don't. Look at Haiti. Haiti um, is definitely a growth disaster. It's incredibly slow, or actually just incredibly negative, economic growth rates. So why is this the case, right? Why are some countries growth disasters and other countries growth miracles? Well, it could be for a number of reasons. One could be being hit by a natural disaster that you can't recover from that easily. You know, if you think of a small island in the middle of the ocean that gets wiped out by an earthquake, and they weren't really all that prosperous to begin with, they can't easily rebuild, getting hit by the Clintons isn't really going to help, and getting materials there is going to be incredibly difficult. Now, a poorly functioning government can make that happen too. Suppose a country like North Korea got hit by a natural disaster. The country's already a disaster, so they're already extremely poor. Uh, their government is screwed up to the nth degree. They don't really have the infrastructure to repair. They really just have to depend on China for a lot of that. The government being corrupt makes all that even harder. Um, so, yeah, if North Korea got hit by a disaster, they'd be kind of screwed. Now, if you're noticing, right, two big things here. is, well, we've got the government and we've got the ability to recover from things. I guess three things. Because, well, there's also, you know, how easy it is to get stuff there. You know, 
so the, a, a country in the middle of an ocean or North Korea, it's kind of hard to get things there because, well, one, it's isolated by a lot of water, and the other is isolated by a lot of really dumb people. Um, so if you're noticing, though, a lot of some of this is physical, some of it is well policy. But we can go a little bit more into that later on. This concludes the chapter for now. So we talked about what economic growth is. We talked about how we can mathematically model it and what certain types of growth are. Um, soon we're going to be learning about a growth model that actually helped develop a lot of dynamic macroeconomics. And the guy who got it got a Nobel Prize in economics. And unfortunately, he also died like two weeks ago. Uh, rest in peace, Bob Solo. Uh, but first... Um, well, it says we're going to go over some math. We actually went over that math already. Uh, I guess some of these lecture notes are a little out of order. My mistake on that one. Um, but, you know, it was just some algebra, so whatever. Ignore those two bullet points. So I'll just say until next time, peace. Uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you when we get to the solo growth model. Thanks for watching. Bye.